Hey, welcome back to the Rhetoric Warriors podcast. We are teaching America to persuade each other because they don't know how. I've seen it. I've seen it done badly. It's, it's ongoingly done badly. You can find us on social media, Rhetoric Warriors. Uh, you can go to rhetoricwarriors.com. Take our one-year master course in persuasion. Get a newsletter each week uh, with a learning module. It's going to show you how to recover lost family members, get the non-crazy people elected again, all the good stuff. So go to rhetoricwarriors.com. I am Dr. Dan, rhetoric PhD, escaped professor, also stand-up comedian and commie writer from Late Night in Hollywood. I'm now out here handing out persuasion tools to the world uh, via rhetoricwarriors.com. This podcast is has three purposes. I convert the right so right-wingers come on, Trump voters, and I try to convert them. That's always fun. I talk to comedians about their politics and how their crazy brains filter all the stuff that's going on. And I bring in persuasion pros to tell you all the secrets you need to magically take people from where they are to where you want them to be by God, because that's what it's all about. So welcome to the Rhetoric Warriors. I'm going to introduce this week your guest who... Uh, <laughs> makes me laugh one of my one of my favorite comedians uh mike panzer he's I, I think former air force is that right yeah yeah former, former air, air force, force former dell marketing executive right yep. former uber driver yeah yeah former. former definitely former now living with his parents in a florida retirement community still that is correct <laughs> all right uh pot advocate i think very much so Heart attack survivor. Yep. Yep. Anger management issues. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> A few <laughs> of those. And I and from what I what I know, Mike leans right uh, to the right. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't I thought for a little while it was fun to be call yourself a libertarian. Like it was a fun game to play. But no, I'm, I'm not a libertarian. Um, OK. Well, I think it's I think it's just because you like being an asshole, right? Like you're gonna you're gonna pick whatever party is the biggest pain in the ass. For sure, oh, to an extent, yeah, um, yeah. Why? I mean, that. Why else do it? I mean, if you can't piss people off, what's what's the point <laughs> of existing? <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, so Mike likes to like to stomp on the snowflakes. Uh, welcome, Mike Panzer, everybody. Mike. Hey, good to see you, Dan. Good to be here. For those who don't know, because I usually I'm not showing the uh, visuals to these podcasts, Mike's background has a uh, Florida County Sheriff's three of them uh, on the road behind him, cars in his front yard. What's the deal with that, Mike? You're in Florida. Oh. Yeah, I mean, so naturally, there's going to be cops around. It's they're they're everywhere <laughs> here, for and and for good reason. We need them. Um, yeah, Florida is. <laughs> oh my! It, there's no place. Else. It's the drain of the United States. It is. There's no place like it in the planet. We even somehow managed to get other countries' problems. We're we're the we're now the the like the colostomy bag of the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the drain of the U.S. Like every redneck all across the U.S. who fails in other areas of the country is like, you know what? I'm moving to Florida. <laughs> you know, at least it's warm. And then it's a magnet for all the losers from the rest of the world who are trying to get into America. It's like going up the funnel. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it, it's kind of like Los Angeles for people that suck. Like, I'm going to go to <laughs> Florida to make it mediocre. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's where they come here. It's for. mediocre California. <laughs> I like it. It is. Uh, I, I lived there for four years in Tampa, and there's no place else like Florida. I tell people I drove down there, you know, 20 hours or whatever, where I was coming from North Carolina, big truck, pulled into the apartment parking lot that I was going to be living in, parked, and looked over to my right, and there was a black Trans Am in the middle of the day, and the passenger side door was open. I just saw this bleached blonde hair up above the uh, level of the door. And I looked over and it was a drunk chick peeing in the parking lot. <laughs> and she raised her beer and she's like, woo. I'm like, welcome to Florida. That's yeah, that's 
that is the state in a nutshell. That was probably like Monday around two in the afternoon. I think she was the lieutenant governor. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds about right. This place is a mess. It's a mess. I mean, this. So that picture you were describing, that's the front of the house. We just moved in uh, in October. And this is the day I'm moving in. I'm waiting for the movers to arrive. And I, I smoke a, a bong on the back patio. And and then I could kind of see through the front door, through the house, some police lights. And I'm like, oh, fuck, man. They already got me. I just moved in. And I, I go walking through the house. <laughs> and I look out the front the hell door. hell of a German Shepherd they've got. No shit. I'm like, what shitty place did I move to? And And there's the whole streets filled with cops. The SWAT team's there. There's dogs running around. And, and so I'm like, all right, this definitely wasn't for my weed. This is it's a little <laughs> bit much. And uh, but still, I'm, I'm going, what what kind of place did we just move to where this is on the Saturday afternoon? We arrived. I had to ask the cops to move to let the moving truck get into our driveway. So they, they were all staged right there. Um, and uh, it turned out that a couple houses down, there's an old West Virginia couple, and uh, the old man can't really take care of himself, and his wife fell and broke her hip, so she can't take care of him. So the ambulance came to take him away to a home, and he pulled a gun and was like, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and thus, thus is the trajectory of nearly every... Florida uh, family. That's the conclusion. Somebody pulled a gun and says, I ain't going nowhere. I ain't going nowhere. And, uh, and they brought out the SWAT team for a little old man. I mean, it was a little bit overkill, I think, <laughs> but I mean, I saw cops with AR 15s just running down the street. I'm like, what the hell is going on down there? Turns out it's a 82 year old West Virginia guy that doesn't remember who he is. Don't you think like if you were a cop, you know, you were in the military, so you got to pull triggers, right? Did you ever pull yeah. triggers at live people? Uh, no, no. Fortunately, I never, never got to uh, shoot at an actual person. But you had those weapons. You know, you got to feel like you've got all that training. You know, you're you're loaded. You you are, yourself are a form of loaded gun, but you never get to use it. Don't you feel like when they get in that point where they're like, "Oh, this is this is the time." You know, they're just primed for it. Nah, man, I never like I loved shooting. We'd go out to garbage dumps and shoot at old, you know, washing machines and shit if we had to. But no, not once did I ever. No desire to shoot another person. God, no. You know, I. but, you know, I I I I, I witnessed my best friend die in a tragic accident when we were 16 and I, I saw it all happen so my perspective on life and death maybe for even at a young kid was kind of like I don't ever want to see that again so it got pulled out of story into reality yeah yeah very much so uh, I grew up in Kentucky I saw you know I saw my share of you know actual reality violence Oh, I'm sure. It's never good. It's no. never, you know, some glorious moment. Even when somebody wins a, like, even just a fist fight, you're like, ooh, that didn't, that was unpleasant. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's never, it, it's never good. It's, and it's, uh, and, and it, and it's never like it is on TV or in the movies. It's, you know, they, they have a way of making it look like, uh, nobody's really hurt. Like somehow they're all in a shower after the fight and, they're fine. And I'm like, sure. that guy was unconscious and they stomped on his head. No, he'd be in the in the ICU right now if this were the real world. But yeah, gunshot. They they recover from gunshots like like it's day. nothing. Like a, yeah. you know, it's like oh, it went right through. I'm fine. Yeah. That's the way it works. Yeah, no, yeah. I uh so yeah, I never never once I don't even think I ever said the words like I'd like to shoot somebody, even in anger. Like, uh, well, how'd you end up in the Air Force? Okay, so let's let's figure out where to start this because I have a lot of things to talk to you about. Sure. So this podcast um, is, you know, it, it explores politics, it explores people's orientation to, uh, you know, 
America and how they, you know, how they vote and all that kind of stuff. And uh, you've always kind of fascinated me because you have a very, you know, out there lifestyle. Not out there, out there, but alternative, like, you know, pot and things like that. And you're very, it seems to me, very culturally open. I try to be. But you're also kind of politically right. I, you know, I, 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 I'm less right every year. You know, when I was 27 and running for office as a Republican in New York, I was super right wing. I mean, I I was at the Republican National Convention in San Diego that year for Bob Dole. I mean, I was I was. Oh, tell me about this. So give me the background on that. What what year was this? This was uh, 90, 97 or 96. I think 96. Um, and so it was when Dole Kemp were running. And uh, I had gotten out of the Air Force and I got into the, I don't know, the young Republicans. <laughs> and I, I don't know, I just got caught up in the whole thing. And I lived in a district that had never been uh, won by a, a Republican in like 40 years. And so they threw me to the wolves. They were like, hey, this kid will do it. And uh, I won a primary by like three votes. Um, <laughs> out of the four votes you won, yeah. by and that was against the former mayor of our town. Um, and I think he had supposedly something with little kids. So I don't know. I mean, so it, it should have been that close. Really? Did you give speeches? Uh, uh, no, but I did go to like press conferences where they'd ask questions and I had to, I had to have answers prepared. I was not very good at this at all. I, I really <laughs> didn't know anything of the issues i i knew pretty amazing you've run for office yeah what a primary i yeah i won a primary and then i lost the general to uh the guy who was the police chief in the neighboring town uh so uh and uh and actually this was all while clinton uh was being investigated for lewinsky um because uh my opponent was out there campaigning in his uniform and squad car. And so the Republican party put in a complaint to the uh, United States department of justice that he was violating the hatch act, which says that you can't be in charge of a department in the district and in charge of deciding who gets the money. Um, So they, they sent a guy out, all the way from D.C. to investigate this, and then they recalled them for the Lewinsky case, and they just said, whatever, and, and this guy <laughs> continued. That Hatch Act doesn't really seem to have a lot of teeth. Not much teeth at all. Um, apparently, they were, it was more important to see about a guy fingering some chick in the Oval Office. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so you were, you were heavily right-wing then, is that right? Or were you just, you were just espousing the talking points? Did you believe uh, it? You know, I thought I did. I, I espoused the talking points. This is back at the, the height of Rush Limbaugh. I, I even was in the studio audience when he had his television show a few times. Really? I had, I had his ties. Because uh, you got to admit, the guy had some snazzy freaking ties. Like he had a, <laughs> he had a, a designer that, because he had some ridiculous wardrobe budget. That's how he was, I think, skimming money. Um, On his, came bu- out. Yeah, his ties. He, 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 pocketed like two three million on oh yeah those ties but you know and i had his book and uh i think i was sold i i i wasn't exposed to much i grew up in a a pretty small rural upstate new york town what was the town uh goshen Uh, Goshen. bible town yeah really Um, a bible town you're a jew well, Goshen was where the Jews lived in Egypt during. Okay, the, it sounds like a place where the Jews would hide out. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we're strangely not many of us at the New York one. Just a, <laughs> just a handful. A uh, very Catholic town. Uh, we had the uh, the good uh, fortune to be listed as one of the towns at the uh, end of that uh, movie about the priests molesting kids. So that was awesome. Oh, for spotlight. Us. 
yeah, yeah. They the Goshen's right there in the credits at the end. Um, because well, I'm from Louisville, and Louisville uh, was like one of the hot spots of that. Like there were multiple cases. There was I can't remember the guy's name, but there was a priest there who had some real issues. And when I was in the fifth grade, I went to Catholic uh, grade schools, high schools, college, everything, kindergarten. Lucky you. But in the fifth grade, they identified me as a kid who might become a priest. And they wanted me to go to Niagara Falls to the seminary up there for a weekend to check it out. And I did not go. That's probably a good decision. That was probably a good decision. We wouldn't, we'd be having a very different discussion right now. Probably so. It might've, it might've altered, altered Everything. voice. Well, I mean, like five suicides out of people I went to high school with when it all came out in uh, the 2000s. Like it was crazy. Heroin Ouch. became an issue. Like this guy molested a boat and he would just take him down to the Jersey shore and buy him beer. And, and then he diddle him, I guess. And, uh, and they had transferred him in from another parish where the same shit had happened. Wow. So, so yeah, Goshen. So, Goshen. <laughs> and, uh, and then our claim to fame, our other claim to fame is we are the first trotter track in America. Really? Yes, so the Hall of Fame of the Trotters is there. Which may be, it's like the speed walking of the horse racing world. It's the goofiest yeah. way to run horses. It is, and it's the most fixed race there is. Uh, my dad got caught in a riot in Yonkers Raceway in the 60s because one of them got fixed, and he's like, it was crazy. We're standing there, and they all came out in the line, and they just stayed in the line all the way around. And then when we start hearing, the fix is in, and then like, fire starts fucking getting thrown <laughs> around and chairs and people are punching cops and he's like that was just a regular thing at the at the uh at the raceway for the trotters it was man just... america seems like it it used to be more horrifying in some ways but also more fun like when there were so many less rules there was so much less developed like there's some crazy crazy shit that used to happen in this country they're they're definitely I mean, yeah it definitely was more fun um but we tend to opt for uh, safety and security in this country in lieu of fun, <laughs> like, you know, bubble wrapping our kids with helmets and knee pads and shin guards and mouth guards. And yeah. Stuff. See, in the past, your West Virginia 82 year old uh, dementia patient on your street would have just lived there and just been walking out in the front yard, just firing off that gun every day. And then until yeah. another neighbor took him out. Exactly. And back then, that guy up the road was just a dirty old man and don't go to his house. Like that was it. Now, now I think that's a little, yeah. I always think that that's so funny when people, Oh yeah. We all had a pedophile in the neighborhood back in the day. We just avoided him. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's what pedophiles let you do. They just let you avoid them. You know, Yeah, it was such a weird time to just your parents would be like, listen, don't go to that house down at the end of the street. That guy's a weirdo. They knew, they knew he touched kids and they all, their, their whole, their, all they did was just say, just don't go over there. Yeah. Like that was the full extent of, of your safety briefing. Well, I'm glad we're, you know, 15 minutes in and we've covered most yeah. of the pedophilia issues. Well, that's, on Goshen and that's part of what of shaped me. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so is Goshen where you ran for what would you run for a uh, county legislator? So yeah, it was going to be, it was in the district there are several towns within the district and we were actually the county seat so it, it, it's an important seat as far as bullshit county politics goes but um frankly i'm glad i lost i was gonna say i can't imagine you sitting through uh, council meetings oh god it was it was it was torture just wearing fucking three-piece suits and suspenders and ties and <laughs> those burgundy dress shoes i just you know for a little while like i said it was fun it was you know like i'm playing dress up look at me i'm hanging out with a congressman i got suspenders on like i feel important which is pretty cool for a kid who flunked out of music school and like had no didn't even have a bachelor's degree and all of a sudden i'm wheeling and dealing and hanging out with party people and uh but i don't know I it's a all, lot of it you know i see a lot of Especially, you know, I guess the youth politics on both sides, uh, Republicans and Democrats, but a lot of it's like, oh, you know, these are nerds who never got anything 
in the regular system, like yeah. in sports and not, not even in academics and stuff like that. And it, it's another, another area that they can enter and, and somehow succeed. And you can just see it in their eyes. It's like, Oh, I've gotten, I'm getting some attention over here. And th- that's why I say sometimes, like I see, especially on the right, I think a lot of people espousing things that I doubt they believe, you know, it's just this sense of, of community and identity and, and power, you know, that you can grab within politics. It you is all the time with Trump rallies, right? Like the guys in trucks and stuff with no teeth, they've never been able to get on camera or, or even, you know, get any no. attention before now, suddenly the worse they are, the more people pay attention to them. Well, I think that's just human nature. And I think I like, I mean, you know, you see, you know, at the, at a lot of the marches for the protest, they were fine until a news camera showed up. And now some guy's going to throw a flame and bottle into a fucking window because <laughs> right. ah, the fucking news is here. And I think that's just human nature is people crave attention. I mean, did, did you notice all the Hollywood actors after about two months of lockdown, suddenly we're <laughs> tweeting like sons of bitches. Like, I got to get attention. Nobody's thinking about me. Alyssa Milano went on a freaking rampage because nobody's the phone stopped ringing. Yeah. And, no, that's I mean, look at stand ups right now. Yeah. They're just sitting there, you know, slowly withering away. And how can I do a Zoom show? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and it's it's I get it. Like I I miss the attention. I did a show recently, my first one since February, and uh, and it was pretty awesome. But uh, I don't know if I'm ready to do one again for a little <laughs> while yet. Like I, me and the the other comic were the only two people that wore a mask, and w- and they looked at us like we were crazy because we were up in the panhandle and. I was like, ah, they're like, it was a live show, live show, about a hundred people there. Really? And uh, yeah. And they even said breathing at you all looking, all breathing at you a hundred, just, just vacuum reverse vacuums, just shooting their, you know, fetid corrupted breath at you. Oh yeah. It was, uh, and, and, uh, not a mask. They even said, you know, you don't meet, need that up here. And I'm like, well, that's why I'm wearing it because <laughs> <laughs> it's nobody else is. <laughs> um so you did your whole show without a mask yeah with the mask no no without a mask i took the mask off for the show and then i put it right back on and had it on afterwards when the i I don't know you know ron feingold seems like i know that name he uh he does acapella stuff with uh one of those looper machines (laughs) where he (laughs) does like 15 classic stand-up comedy Yes, yes. And then he has a he has a keychain that does uh fuck you when you push a button in like a 20 part harmony. And he he sells ten dollars a piece or six for fifty bucks, and every single person in there came up like give me five of those. It was crazy. That's great. And so yeah, we wore the masks for sure and we're like, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna shake hands. Here you go, buddy. <laughs> God, um, just I mean, you would, yeah, until you get a vaccine, I wouldn't go anywhere near that many people. No, I mean, I just had a heart attack in October. So, like, I'm I'm in a high-risk group now. <laughs> um, I already was for asthma, but now I got asthma and heart disease. And, you know, I'm, I mean, it takes the body a good amount of time to completely recover from, from the heart attack and procedures. No, so, really? Not yeah. in movies. No, not in the movie. You had a heart attack and got shot. Yeah. Back, you know, 20 minutes later. On the street, killing people with double fisted Uzis. Just. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's stay. I'm going to try. I'm going to, I'm going to try to keep uh, us on track. Interview you multiple times because, like I said, it's always interesting to me. But let's stay with the uh, politics. I'm still fascinated by the fact that you ran for an office public office and won a primary and and almost got elected and knew nothing nothing i didn't know was the full extent of the issues i knew was there was something about they wanted to put a private jail in the county that was all i knew about any issues everywhere and people still voted for me hundreds of them how did they vote for you what was what was the uh i mean what was your your platform what what 
how did how did they did they just vote for Democrat no matter what? Well, Were you yeah. Republican or Democrat? I was Republican. Okay, Republican, right? Sorry. Yeah, and uh, I I mean I went door to door with little handout cards and shit that had talking points that the Republican Party gave to me, but that was that was it. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I think it's just another example of how people tend to just vote party line without even. I mean, I, I, I didn't even own property in the county. Like, I'm not, <laughs> which is very well, this weird. Is part of the thing, and I always make this argument, like what Trump did was he came in and he added all this entertainment value to politics and he upped the stakes of politics. So he took away American, American politics is we have the right to ignore all of it and not think about any of it. Yeah. And it still pretty much just runs okay. That's the way it's always been. But Trump came in and has forced everybody to pay attention to politics, and it's just agitated everyone. For sure. And, and I mean, the timing is uh, probably the timing. I don't know if you saw that Social Dilemma um, documentary about Facebook and social nah, I media, which I, I had already I had insight into that stuff when I had meetings with them when I was in partnership marketing at Dell. I already, I, I started to see the change in the data we would get about people and how much more information and how much gra more granular it would get about behaviors and shit. And I was like, this is creepy, man. This is not <laughs> right. And there's an old saying, if you can't, if, if you don't know, if you can't figure out what the product is, you're the product. And you look at Facebook, you go, well, what is their product? Oh, it, it's me. It's all of my information that they're selling. And what they found is the algorithms uh, determine that uh, you'll, you'll interact more with things that piss you off than things that make you smile. So it's designed to figure out what bothers you and fill your feet up with that. Yeah. So people, so you put Trump and then you put people already on edge because all day long, they're just getting nothing to judge. Son of a bitch. Fuck that guy. You know, why would you say that? Fuck you, you son of a bitch. Like all day long. And now you throw Trump into the mix and it's just, it's explosive. Well, I know like a few times I'll be at the gym or something and there'll be like Judge Judy or something on the TV that I can't get away from for a few minutes. And if you ever listen to that stuff, it's so agitating. Like the everybody on all these shows, they're such assholes. Yeah. want to scream at them. And I'm like, I'm not going to watch this. It immediately pulls you over into agitation. It does. But then you've got, so, I mean, I get some insight with my folks. So my dad loves, loves Judge Judy. Holy <laughs> shit. Judge Judy is on. I mean, if she was on 20, if there was a Judge Judy channel, it would be on all day long. And uh, he likes to repeat phrases that she says, you know, how I know you're lying. Your lips are moving. And so I think there's a generation that they feed on that. And oh, sure. Any, I mean, it's very effective. Like when yeah. you watch it, you're it's going to stick. It's going to get you into that emotional space. And they give you some, you know, catharsis at the end because Judge Judy gets in everybody's face and makes a decision, you know, yeah. and it's done. And so it feels a little satisfying because whoever the asshole was basically gets what they, you know, deserve. Exactly. And you get to see rule and law enforced and, you know, you get to say things to other people like, well, Judge Judy says, take pictures of everything when you move into a new place. That's how they get you. So like <laughs> there's it, it, it really I think there is a I'm surprised that my general like we're not more into that, given that Judge Wapner was kind of popular when when we were young. But he yeah, was but a that different stuff was of... always for the afternoon crowd, the older people who had nothing else to do. Like if you had any type of mobility in life, you know, you're were, you were not sitting around watching Judge Wapner. You were yeah. uh, going out and getting agitated at real people. <laughs> uh, yeah, or getting high. That was my thing. All right, pull you back. Back to the, you know, let's, let's, let's talk yeah. about this election thing. So you were in the Republicans and the young Republicans went up for office, lost. And what happened after that? I cut ties and moved to Nashville. 
<laughs> Literally. That was the end of your political career. Yep. The, that was it. That was it. I was done. In fact, I, I, I kind of made it a, uh, a, a life plan to just never think about that shit, if at all possible, because it really is just to, it just shit makes you angry and, and it's all unpleasant. There's not all of the people involved are unpleasant people to be around every single one of them, no matter what example, party they like, are. Who do you remember? Oh, I met Senator D'Amato. Uh, he shook a hand like a dead fish with that limp fucking soggy <laughs> handshake. I'll never forget that. I was just like, oh, God, is that guy even alive? Just gross. D'Amato, uh, is he a New Yorker? Yeah, he was uh he was um he was the senator from Long Island. Um I don't I guess uh he's the or I guess he's the one that uh I don't know who's in his seat now. I don't know, but uh he was a Republican senator. I, I worked closer with congressmen and I don't know, they just all you could tell very quickly that they were all self-serving and full of shit. Uh -huh. um, and, and it just, I don't know. I just felt gross. Like, That's always been my, like I never did, like even when I was getting my PhD and, you know, all the rhetoric work I've done, I, ne I was never interested in politics and I'm still not interested in politics. I'm interested that it became a massive cultural phenomenon you know, and I'm interested in watching the right, all the crazy shit that they've adopted, you know, that they'll do. It fascinates me. But I always got the sense, like everybody I've known all the way back from like student council in high school were the worst, most, you know, unpleasant, unuseful people. And they would just go there because nobody else wanted to do anything in politics. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's why would you? And it's not like I did politics in I wasn't in debate club or student government or any of that shit. And, and I really, you know, part of it may have been, well, I, I think there's just a lot of, um, a lot of things in my background probably fed into that. Um, having conservative parents, that's definitely going to, uh, that that's, it's going to position me that way to begin with. Um, doing the military thing, um, going, I spent a, a year of college in Israel. Um, and so, uh, I've always been very pro Israel. And so that's always been more of a con Republican party alignment, I guess. Um, and having come back and seeing some of the shit I saw there, um, in Israel. Yeah in terms of how Israel was portrayed here in the news versus what actually was going on there. Um, and that was, you know, way before the internet. So like what, give me some examples. Well, there was something called the temple Mount crisis while I was there at the Western wall above the Western wall is the dome of the rock, which is a holy Muslim place. And, um, um, at some point in the day, a bunch of men came out of the Dome of the Rock and stood on the tops of the walls. It's, uh, it's like a courtyard with walls on three sides uh, and started throwing rocks down on all the people praying there. Um, and there's two tunnels at the base of the walls. So the it was who, wall. what who, who was praying, like which group was praying? Jews. Jews. So the okay. Jews play at the Western Wall and then above that is where the muslim temple is oh that's a great setup <laughs> yeah yeah it is so they're throwing rocks down on all these old jews there's two tunnels at the base the police there were like seven cops they start shoving everybody into those tunnels to get them out of the rocks and at that point men start coming down from above and surrounding the cops and, it, and it, at a point shots get fired you know, the cops, are, they're surrounded, they're mobbed by hundreds of people. I mean, there was, and unlike in the U.S., they carry Uzis there. <laughs> so a uh, few people did get shot. But then my parents recorded what was on the news here, and I got to watch it. And 
it showed it, it was like soldiers shooting ambulances and shit and i'm like that there were no soldiers there at all like but it, so I, I was very bothered by that because it was clear to me that there's some type of agenda at play that they're trying to make israel look like uh like oppressors and I didn't feel that way when I was there. I got to spend time in, in Muslim villages across from the farm that I lived on, hung out with their kids that were our age. Everybody got along great um, outside of the holy city. So, but that's not what at the time they were saying about Israel here. So, you know, when I left, people were like, are you terrified to go? You're going to get murdered. I'm like, no. It was great it was an awesome time other than that one instance it was an awesome time i ate a lot of fudge there was a pizza hut in tel aviv i mean it was a great time <laughs> I went scuba diving and coral reefs in the red sea it's an awesome beautiful country a lot to do there um but i came back really pissed off at what i perceived as the left-wing media um, yeah i think you know and you still hear this this is clearly one of the major themes of the right uh, it's a misunderstanding of what the media is capable of. You know, media basically is mindless. Like it, it covers story structures and it's a better story to tell, you know, that Israel is a dangerous place and, you know, has right. these religious conflicts constantly. It's the same way. Like I live in Texas and my kids went to Australia for a while and everybody in Australia asked them about their horses and their guns, you know, and their cowboy hats. The media can only cover, you know, a tiny, tiny little bit of a of any culture, any community, and it tells the most dramatic story. So yeah. it's driven by story. It's not really driven by a left wing or even a right wing. You know, until you know recently, I think you know the Fox News is different and the Limbaugh thing was different. But you know, it's just it's just the nature of media. If you get your information about a place through the media you're going to get a tiny little pinhole, you know, and then everybody believes it's the whole story. Oh yeah, of course. And, but you know, that, that was very much, I was a, you know, a 20 year old kid. No, at that time I was, I was 18. I, I, cause I went to college at 17. So I was 18 when I got home, I was pissed off. I went to school in the States. Um, Kuwait got invaded. A lot of kids at the state college, uh started acting out initially like ah fuck these like they they thought that they were they want to be vietnam hippies so right. they were immediately like oh we're gonna protest baby killing soldiers and i'm like and that bothered me because i come from my brother's navy my dad's marines my, my uncle was air force um and i knew that that's not what was going on and these kids were just ill-informed and and wanting attention and uh I flunked out of school that year, joined the Air Force. Um, that was during the Clinton administration when he started closing bases around the world. So towards the end of my time in the Air Force, they were paying people to get out because there just wasn't enough room anymore. So many bases had closed. And so that kind of kept me leaning on the right wing path because as somebody who had a perspective a military perspective i didn't see closing that many bases and reducing our force the way we were as a good idea so that kind of may have been you know you in your mind you're like well republicans like the soldiers so i'm gonna keep up with that um so would you say because it sounds like a lot and I, I think this is very common that a lot of your beliefs or the uh, decisions that you're making, the way that you were leaning your allegiances were reactions against things that you saw. So I think this happens like yeah. with a lot of people now, even now, like I've got friends who are typically, I would call them moderates and they may be even, you know, more towards liberal, more towards Democrat, but then they see like things that are coming down from alternative communities, you know, like the more extreme LBQ teeth stuff, you know, oh yeah or you know like the language issues that are coming out around gender and they just react against it and you can see it just pushing them farther and farther to the right for sure and that's i've i've been saying that for a long time and that uh the biggest 
problem challenge the left biggest hurdle the left has is reining in all of the fringe voices that are scaring the shit out of people over stupidity um because you've got a lot of people who are kind of moderate but they're not they're not that educated they're not maybe critical thinkers but they hear that shit they go well i know i don't like that and that's associated with them so i'm gonna go with these guys and it, it really is undermining i think the left's ability to make headway and maybe convert the the fence sitters yeah it's um, interesting like from a rhetoric perspective trying to explain again sort of the media and what what reaches people is the extremes yeah period you know, well, what most, is it? 10% most... of the people on Twitter are responsible for 80% of the tweets. Yeah, easily. You know, and the the things that get retweeted, you know, are always the craziest shit. Like right now, you know, all the people going off in drugstores or, you know, at the grocery about I'm not going to wear my mask. You know, they're they'll they will get a vid if you get a video of that, it's gonna go around the world so fast. Oh, yeah. But it's a nice extreme version of something. And the problem is that when that comes your way and you're making your judgments based on that, it's going to skew again away from that. You're like, no, I know I don't like that. Ergo, I'm now moving over here. And the, the left has to figure out, you're right, some type of matrix to be able to, to handle that because yeah. it's happening all over the place. Wasn't I think that was an old Greg Giraldo bit where he talked about the Israelis and the Arabs and he's like they look alike the only difference is one of them goes la, 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 la. and he's like <laughs> Americans are like I know I don't like that sound so I'm going with the, these guys yeah and that's that's how we do everything it's I don't like that so I'm gonna go with any alternative well the reason you know you talk about cognition versus emotion like you you know what your emotions are like when you experience something and if it's negative you're like oh I can now make a judgment yeah, you, know, you don't have to go deeply into it. Like, why do they make this sound? What does it mean? How many of them make this sound? That's all cognitive. But Americans and human beings in general like to make emotional based decisions. And people do this all the time. My son's 18 now and he's trying to figure out, you know, exactly kind of what his trajectory is going to be. He doesn't want to go to college and he's got a lot of options for things about where he wants to live. And I keep telling him you can't it's hard to make that decision because it's an abstraction. Typically, yeah. people will move somewhere and if they hate it. They're like, oh, I'm not going to do that again, you know, but he has nothing in his life that he hates. He doesn't have anything in his life, like living here in Austin that he particularly loves. So he doesn't know how to make the decision because there's no emotional, there's no emotion informing his decision. Right. Like he hasn't experienced it, had emotional reaction. And now he's got some type of path because the emotional reaction was clear. Like I grew up in Kentucky. I knew at five, it was time to get out of, you know, Kentucky. <laughs> Like I knew it like in my bones because I experienced like, oh yeah, this is not my place. Sure. I mean, you, you, you know, if you're, I guess maybe self-aware enough to make that recognition, but a lot well, of people don't even need that. Really. That's why I say like emotions. Like if you grew up in a shitty family or you get hit a lot, you're like, oh yeah, this isn't good. You know, I need to get out of here. You know, I, yeah, you're right. I guess I've been listening to a lot of true Two true crime podcasts and it seems like yeah a lot of serial killers started out that way and even they are like yeah i know i didn't like getting beat by my parents and raped <laughs> by his friends like they they understood they still did it to people but they didn't at least they knew enough that they didn't like it and they were going to try and escape having that done to them yeah that's a clear human you know again evaluation system pain versus pleasure i like this i don't like this we can all make that judgment. And that's, I would say, I don't know, 80, 90% of politics doesn't go beyond that level. It doesn't go into this deep cognition where you do analysis and really understand where this comes from and all that. That's a tiny minority of how people experience all this stuff. Sure. Well, that's, that's a lot of work. That's, that's <laughs> a is. lot of work and it's, and it's frustrating and it's scary because you have to accept that at the end of it all, you may conclude that you were wrong and nobody <laughs> wants to go down that path on something that they so firmly uh, 
uh, some idea that they're behind firmly. Nobody wants to go down to, well, let me just question 15 steps down the road and see if I still agree with this, because a lot of times they might not. I get into, uh, like I said, I'm not particularly conservative. My father and my brother are. And a lot of time of the time, what drives them nuts is that I just question what they say. And they go, you know, uh, I go, you know, I, I can't even think of one off the top of my head, but they'll, they'll, they'll repeat. Where do they talk. stand on the election right now? Do they believe it was faked? Oh, they was believe it, it was stolen. Yeah, they, they believe there was fraud, definitely, and that it was stolen. And that this has been a plan for a long time. Um, they firmly believe that. So they don't um, need, they don't need much evidence. No. No, well, they think so. They're they're willing to go off the circumstantial evidence. Well, you know, there. What happened to those two hundred thousand votes that showed up in the middle of the night? And this guy over here said this, and this happened over. And I'm like, yeah, that's like these lunatic conspiracy guys that are like, well, the number six shows up in this document. <laughs> right. Really, really different. sketchy evidence is fine. But you know, if. I learned a long time ago doing the marketing stuff that you can, can you can tell whatever story convincingly you want if you have enough puzzle pieces to present it however you want. We did that with data all the time. You'd go in and say, well, this is what the numbers are saying. And the vice president go, well, that's not what I want to present. So can you make it look more like this? And you're like, <laughs> yeah, I'll just go change this number and use that one instead of that. And now we got this graph. Yeah. And that's that way with, I think, with with everything people, um, you know, you could take the kids in cages and present that story in 50 different ways to 50 different people. Um, yeah. And some of them are going to be like, yeah, see, they should be there. And some of them are going to walk away from their version and go, they're being well taken care of. And other ones are going to walk away going, that's just horrifying. And it's uh, all on how you present the same story. Well, and this is why, you know, like I started, you know, me, I'm a, I've been a stand up and a comedy writer and I've got the whole area of my life and I like making a living just doing that stuff. I wrote on some political comedy shows and it's fun, but just doing the fun part of it is great. If I was still in Hollywood and, you know, making my, you know, cash for jokes, I'd be perfectly happy. Uh, I got moved out and live and live in Austin. And so I, you know, I got into marketing and all these different ways of making a living because I couldn't do it just through entertainment. But eventually, like when Trump came up and I saw like this massive shift in the public rhetoric over to like the vast use of sketchy evidence. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm suddenly like, oh, you know, maybe I should try to do something with my rhetoric PhD to try to help people, you know, sift through this. Because right now we're moving down towards some really, you know, questionable politics. Because if you don't have good, like even basic rhetoric training like that, to be able to look at the rhetoric, break it apart a little bit and go, that's that information, that evidence is too sketchy for me to draw a strong conclusion. I mean, that's a basic tenet of logic, right? Sure. So you got to look at the quality of the evidence. You got to wait. And it's called a warrant, an argument between the claims and the evidence. There's a warrant. Say, I've got enough evidence. It now warrants me to draw this conclusion strongly. And people have lost warrant completely. And oh, yeah. they don't understand evidence, and but they're fine with claim, conclusion. You know, they're these super strong conclusions. And I keep like in the rhetoric warriors project, part of it is to move people back and go, hey, let me teach about evidence. Let me teach about warrants so that you don't end up on these crazy conclusions. Like the guy who just blew up half of Nashville because he yeah. thought 5G was, you know, being uh, pumped into his brain. That's a crazy conclusion, but you can see why you can get there from bad evidence, bad warrants, all the way to bad conclusions. Well, and that's that's uh, where we go back to the internet is really, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, enabled a lot of this because it's easy to call yourself a subject matter expert. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, when we were kids, to get on the news, you had to actually be an expert right? to talk about something. 
And now you could just go online and be like, I am a specialist in yada, yada, yada. And here's what I have to say about it. And know for sure that at least 10,000 people will agree. Yeah, we and are not, our brains, our systems, our language, none of it's designed for this multi-log. Like you, no. you weren't designed to be in dialogue with, you know, 10,000 people or 100,000 people or a billion people 150 i think isn't that dunbar's number but not even that like you can't talk to 150 people at the same time you can talk no. to two maybe yeah maybe that gets confused i have a hard time talking to more than one for sure uh and yeah it's it's too much it's it's yeah we're not supposed to be connected to this many people and as much as I love the, the exchange, the free exchange of ideas, Jesus, you should, I mean, the, the person who thinks that the earth is flat should not have as much of a platform as the person who, uh, <laughs> who says the earth is round. <laughs> like, I mean, it's just, it, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's scary. We all come through the same pipeline, you know? It used to be like the platform itself has credibility. You know, this is why like people are always like fake news. You know, the news is liberal biased. And I'm like, so Walter Cronkite was liberally biased. I'm no. Like, and what do you mean? Of course not. You know, because he had a black, a white shirt and a black tie and horn rim glasses. Well, I think part of his people don't even really know what news is anymore. They take editorialization as news. I mean, half of these shows on Fox and CNN and MSNBC they're editorial. These people yeah. are not reporting news. They're giving you. But they look just like newscasters. Right. And they Sound said they all have like that same tempo and they look at you the same way. And then they Their turn to this camera. Their tone is the same. Their delivery is the same. They have that stack of paper on the table. Yeah. It's, yeah. And so, yeah, people are utterly confused as to what actually. So when they go fake news, well, no, you were just listening to somebody give their opinion. That's the, He's not a news reporter. Tune in at six, you'll get the news. Um, I watch News 13 mo more than any networks because it tells me what the weather is, what's going on locally and in Orlando, and that's really all I give a shit about. <laughs> Am I going to get rained on today? Yes, that's it. no. <laughs> Did the stimulus get signed? Good. All right, I'm out. <laughs> so that's all I needed. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so, so you... There, like I said, I'm going to interview you again yeah. because you touch on all these different things, you know, that I'm that I find interesting. But let's just sort of finish off your political history here. So you got in the Air Force, uh, you you got out of the Air Force, you ran, you you lost. You're like, I'm cutting ties. I'm moving to Nashville. I'm going to be a country singer. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. I'm I'm I was already kind of doing country music. I got to sing uh, the national anthem for. Bob Dole and Jack Kemp at, at their fundraiser. And that was uh, uh, not good. Not good. I not started, good? Why? I started too high and I couldn't hit the high note anymore. And now forever in my head, I start too high so I can never sing that song again. They fucked me up. <laughs> it's just a weird thing in my head now. Um, but uh yeah, I went down there to do country and I, I was uh, I, I really didn't want to think about politics. And I don't think I really spent much, if any time thinking about politics until the Obama administration. Um, and I think that's really when politics i think maybe the combination of that's also when facebook popped and i think all of those things that confluence of events over the first couple of years of his administration really is when everybody started thinking about politics all the fucking time because that that was maybe the end of the bush administration the B bush jr um because all of a sudden people could do it without getting in trouble at work. Cause I could just go on Facebook and right. Fucking That's true. Yeah. You suddenly had a way of accessing it other than, you know, I make the point to people a lot that we ignored politics forever. Like they would have the state of the union every year and everybody got upset because it was pre never watched it. Yeah. 
Nobody watched it. They didn't care. They knew it was just going to be a bunch of glittering generalities that didn't mean anything. That's what political talk was. Yeah. I, I actually put out a blog today. I've been doing a blog series of why the right is wrong. And then I'll do why the left is wrong. Um, but the one today was, was literally that the, the right has adopted other playbooks than traditional politics. Like it's adopted entertainment. Yeah. And reality show entertainment, which is all conflict based and blow everything up and constant, you know, villains and heroes and all this stuff. And it's destroyed our ability to ignore politics. Politics is supposed to be boring. It's supposed to be big generalities, you know, that nobody believes. We know that they basically lie, but it's all okay because it's all within a range. But now they've opened up, you know, the borders on that into reality show type lying where, you know, and Trump's, you know, perfect for that. He, he tells reality show level lies and it's like you can no longer ignore it because the entertainment industry figured out how to not let you ignore anything. Oh yeah, that you can't. You can't ignore it. It's it's I have tried. I have tried my damnedest throughout the last 2 years to just ignore it and, and avoid it and it's impossible. People will force it on you. Technology will force it on you. Uh it, it's you can't get away from it. It's baked into every television sitcom now. There's yeah. going to be a Trump joke. All the commercials like it's cracked me up lately all the commercials that are now having masks you know and they're talking about safety like ford had one this weekend on uh football games about ford because you know we're always worried about you and cared about uh, you and our trucks care about you and you know that's the <laughs> like, worst most disingenuous i hated that when i was in marketing at dell we came out with a red laptop for project red for aids we didn't give a shit about AIDS and Project Red. We just thought that that would sell some red laptops to right. women. And and it's so disingenuous that these companies do I that. I saw a girl I, sitting at a coffee shop once with a pink laptop, and on the back it said Free Palestine. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, pink laptop, <laughs> how hard are you working for Palestine over there? <laughs> You know, they don't let you have pink laptops in Palestine. <laughs> <laughs> Crack me up. Oh, man. I, uh, yeah. You so didn't I, think about politics. Obama came back up and all the, you know, social media just started flooding you again. And so suddenly politics is in your face. It did, but it also kind of, uh, ha it touched my family. Um, uh, so his policy affected my my parents ability to retire um now any significant change is going to affect industries some industries are going to lose some are going to win in this case my dad's lost and he was already an old man and not in a position to start over what was his so industry he uh sold medical records equipment so Everything from those big shelving units that slide on the tracks to uh, custom patient chart folders, and uh, which are which are consumables, which are really where the money. You know, he had customers for thirty years. Um, and every six months, they go, "We need you know five hundred more charts." Uh, when um, ACA became law. Uh, it gave medical practices 12 months to convert to digital. Ah. So his entire customer base disappeared overnight, um, at which, you know, and he was planning, he's like, he, he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm 70. I'm, this is my retirement. I still have some customers that call in orders so I can keep fulfilling those orders. Cause you're just drop shipped from the factories. Um, and then overnight, all of that was gone. Um, and uh, coupled with they had taken a huge hit during the crash because they had they had they had taken out a second mortgage to renovate their house to sell it. And right at the time that it was ready for market was when the 07 crash happened. 
So they didn't make the money on the house that they had planned to make to retire to Florida. And then on top of that, when the business collapsed overnight, you know, my dad's 78 and he's fucking driving people to the Orlando airport from Daytona to make ends meet. And it, it was a policy enacted by Obama's administration that created that situation for him. Yeah, I got involved because it was personal. You know, when I went started. after your dad, I remember, yeah. I actually, I remember when Obama was talking about that and this one it's for old man Panzer. He did. He Take did. That, I remember, buddy. you know, and well, you know, and I had the perspective down the line. It wasn't just my dad because I had worked for my dad before Dell. Um, I knew all the plants, all of these plants that made manila folders or all those little color coding stickers that go sure. on the ends of the chart, all of that shit. All of those people, like overnight, out of work. Those plants were shutting down. Um, but it was it never. None of that industry disappearing ever got on the news. Nobody gave a shit. That's funny. That, That's why I said, like you know, the news shows you, you know, an eight percent of <laughs> of an issue, and you never like until you just said this. I got net zero awareness of it. You no, know? who would? Who would even? People don't even think about how those things get to the doctor's office they're just there it's it, i uh back when i was doing uber i drove uh there was a, a convention in orlando for the amusement park industry and i was driving guys there all day long and they were from like oh yeah we make the trash can covers for amusement parks and we and i'm like oh my god all these fucking things that are in these amusement parks you don't even think about yeah. how did they get there there's a guy whose industry is just amusement park ash you know garbage cans so uh you know i started getting involved because i, I at first i was like this can't be right this can't this can't have gone down this way and then i i saw yeah that is the policy that is the law that is and and while i don't disagree that it's a good idea to have everybody's records uh, digitally, just for ease of access. Um, maybe there should have been more flexibility in, you know, because it also hurt those doctors. It drove a lot of doctors to close their practices. Because if you're looking at retiring in 10 years, because you're 60, you don't want to invest 200 grand in computerizing your office. Right. You're going, you know, so a lot of these guys chose early retirement. So there, there was a lot of stuff. So I, I, I won't say ACA is a bad thing I, because I, I think it helped a lot of people, but I think it also hurt a lot of people and there's probably a better way we can do it. Um, but that got me back into paying attention to politics. All right. Well, that's a good place for us to pause. <laughs> this is going to be Mike Panzer, uh, part one. Um, I think it's interesting, like like junctures like that, when the abstract political gets pulled down into the practical everyday life, you know, yeah. that people are living in. And it's hard to keep those connections. It's hard to keep those, you know, ties in between those things. Again, because federal politics and all this stuff, there's so many issues, there's so much going on that it's very easy to just go, this is too complicated. I'm not going to think about it at all. And that's what everybody's again wanted to do with politics for a long time. Yeah. Now, you know, like over the weekend, Trump decided to celebrate uh, Christmas by not signing, you know, the Relief Act for five days. And so people lost a week of unemployment. Everybody had to worry all Christmas long about is this, you know, dude gonna blow this thing up? You know, that's that's the thing. Like when you look up at politics, you're like, oh yeah, everything these guys do has it doesn't trickle down it jets its way down like a bullet, you know, into people's lives. It and so does. you want very responsible people up there, you would hope, you know, who are thinking about all this stuff before they do it. Well, you know, and that's where, like I said earlier, they, they all kind of gross me out. Like this was a perfect example because I'm one of those people that was relying on that unemployment. Florida's fucked. I mean, it's a service industry state. Nobody's coming here to hotels and Disney. So everyone's out of work here. And we have the lowest unemployment pay in the country. I get $125 a week wow. without that federal shit. So 
it's rough. And this whole time, I've been watching, and McConnell, that piece of shit, sitting there. Well, I don't know if the people, it's a disincenting people to go to work. Bullshit. It, you know, I'm not going to work because it's not safe to go to work for me because I'm high risk. It's got nothing to do with getting too much unemployment money. And at the same time, you have Pelosi over there with this enormous three trillion package going, we want all of this or nothing. So both of these assholes are holding <laughs> this hostage for six months, all for political points and to avoid the big douchebag getting any credit, I think, because I don't think McConnell likes him either. Uh, and and I see this happen all the time in politics. They hold us hostage until they get what they want. And it's like, why, why, we're, our shit should come first. Yeah. Like you got people not eating. That's and funny. It's, yeah, it really has become a, a cons we are our own constituency and then they, they are their own constituency. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They yeah. really are. Maybe that's some of the things when you look at um, eventually at, at, the culmination of this stuff, like in a, a democracy 2.0, some different ways of thinking about this because the democracy 1.0 that we've had set up for a long time is clearly broken. We, it's clearly not working. We need to make adjustments. And so somebody needs to lay out what those adjustments are going to be. It's like, I'm going to try, you know, to lay out from my perspective on the rhetoric and communication side, you know, here's some adjustments we should make. And like, even that one of thinking, oh, it's not, you know, these two parties represent the country. It's these two parties represent themselves. And here's the country over here. And you have to figure out how to make them do things. Yeah, that so. is what in a lot of science fiction books I read, there's always a political class in the future. Sure. And that's what we we have here. We have they they see themselves as a separate class from the rest of us. Yeah. Well, and the rich do, too. It's like the rich disappeared. Yeah. The, the rich became invisible at a certain point. They weren't for a long time, like even with the robber barons and all that stuff, the early American capitalism, oh, yeah. capitalists were visible, Albert but now Fish. they've become invisible. You know, you don't see their money. You don't see what they're doing with it. You don't see any of this stuff. So it, it lets them, you know, navigate and do things that they couldn't get away with before. Oh, so yeah. There's a lot of issues like this. And again, the idea of rhetoric warriors is that I've got some training in this and I'm doing work in it so I can help, you know, people at least understand it from a rhetorical perspective of what, what can we do to fix it? And so, you know, talking to uh, comedians and people who have political experiences and, you know, you are very, I think you're very instructive about sort of American culture in general. We'll talk about this maybe next time about how you went from, you know, uh, you were in the military, you were in corporate America and you've systematically moved further and further down you know, the ladder of the society, you know, at least the way society, <laughs> yeah. you know, describes people until the For point sure. where you're like, you know, you're a stand up and you're, you've got an industry, but it's not paying any money, you know, which is the sort of trick about stand up these days. <laughs> yeah. People want it. They want to do it. They have some skills and some ability and they're working hard. There's just no money in it, which, you know, that's uh, an odd form of capitalism to be working that hard and not Very. getting paid. But so you're representative of a lot of things, and I always find it interesting to talk about it. So we will come back again, and we'll talk to Mike Panzer in a couple of weeks, and we'll do Mark, Mike Panzer Part 2. Uh, thanks, Mike. Hey, wow, it was a good time. Good talking to you again, Dan. I look forward to the go next to, time. What is it? Is it MikePanzer.com? How do you? Uh, Mike'sFunny.com. Mike's Funny. I wonder where that, that's a good one. Mike's funny. Mike. I don't, Mike, I was amazed it was still available when I bought it. I was like, holy shit, I got to lock this down. Is it Mike is funny or Mike's funny? Just Mike's funny. Mike's M -I -K -E -S. funny. Mike's funny. Yeah. That or shitbritches.com. I own that <laughs> one too. It will just lead you to Mike's funny. <laughs> of course it will. Um, both theoretically and literally. If you shit your pants, <laughs> you will end up at Mike's funny. All right. I'll talk to you again, Mike. Thanks, buddy. Sounds good, bud. Talk to you later. Yep.